trash up here. It's throwing me off. Anyway, how are y'all doing this morning? I'm so glad Ricky's happy. <laughs> Man, we are in week two of our series entitled, I Love the 90s. And Quentin, he is actually on vacation this week. Um, he needed it. Uh, he was getting on my nerves. No, I'm just kidding. But he's on vacation. It's Brittany. They're celebrating Brittany's birthday this weekend. So they are all hanging out and fishing and things like that. And they will be back next week. Be praying for me tomorrow morning. I, head, I hop on a plane. I head up to New Jersey. I'll be up there for two days, and I'll be speaking at a camp, be speaking to some young people and uh, doing some music and just sharing the gospel. Um, I'll be back Wednesday, and then I'll be back here Sunday. I'll be back at church Sunday for our church luau. And I this week, we're going to be putting out a, a like a dessert and food sheet and all that kind of stuff. Amy's going to kill me because I did not put it out. Actually, I'll just keep you all after church. I'll just print something off real quick from my phone, and then you can sign up for it. But next weekend is our church luau, so be making plans to show up for that. It is going to be so, 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 so much fun. But we are in week two of our series, I Love the 90s. And in week one, we talked about how don't be so focused on your past that you miss what God has for you in the present and in the future. And this week, I want to talk about the cheat code. When I was younger, we used to play video games. They've changed it up now. Now video games are weird, but they had this thing known as the cheat code. And with the cheat code, it was so cool because you could go on a game and then there were certain spots in the game where you put in the cheat code. When I played NBA Jam, you know, they had a cheat code where you can go in there and then you could... To do whatever you had to do, and then all of a sudden, you would always have the fire up mode, which was pretty dope. Mario Brothers, they had a cheat code. They also had cheat tunnels and different things like that. One thing that I'll say about my mom, she worked hard to make sure that we always had the coolest and latest game systems. She also worked hard to make sure she took it away when we were grounded. But when I had it, I knew all the cheat codes. So here we go. There's a, there's a company. It's, it's, a, it's a quiz for all of our, us 90 kids, all right? Is it back in the 90s? There was a company named Komani, right? It's K O M A N I. And Komani had a cheat code. They just popped it up on the screen. Hopefully, y'all didn't see it. But they had a cheat code. Does anybody know what the cheat code was? Somebody give it to me. There you go. Give it up for Stacy. He just saw it up on the screen. But anyway, there it is right there. You ready? Here it is. Go ahead, pop it up there. It is going to pop up. There it is. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, A, B, start. And all the Kamani games, all, on all these games, what happened was, was this. It's for every single game you could use this exact same code. So if you have a Kamani game or if you go by an old system, this is the code that you would use. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, A, B, start. And in each game that you played, there would be something different. Komani made one of my favorite games entitled Contra. And when you play with this on Contra, you can actually run through different levels and not die. And I loved it. And, I, and when I think about these cheat codes in, of, of life, I guess I would say, I sit back and I'm thinking, why didn't God give us a cheat code like this? If he knew we were going to go through all this stuff, why did he not give us a cheat code in order to make it through life? Yesterday, my wife, I was sitting here. We just bought a new car. And then my wife called me yesterday and said, hey, I need you to come pick me up. And I was like, why? The transmission in our Acadia actually went out yesterday. So after service, I'll be taking up a special offering. All right? No, I'm just kidding. But so... Sandra's like, what? But, uh, but I, our, our, it went out, and I'm sitting there, and I was driving, and what I, what I found was is I started getting frustrated. And, and my wife, I was talking to my wife, and she's like, why are you getting frustrated with me? I didn't do it. I was like, I'm not frustrated with you. And maybe you've used this phrase, I'm frustrated with the situation. I'm just frustrated with the situation. And sometimes in life, we don't get frustrated with people, but sometimes we get frustrated with the situation. And, and we may go throughout our day looking upset and angry and so on and so forth. And I may not be mad at you, but I'm mad about what's happening in my day. And it's at those moments that I'm like, okay, God, can you give me a cheat code? And, and most of the time we get upset because we've already been through this. On a video games, a lot of times if you go through a level and you die, a lot of times, sometimes, most of the time, especially if you're me, like when you're playing Call of Duty, you just take the controller, throw it over to the side and be like, I'll get back to this game eventually. And sometimes in life, we get frustrated because we've already been through the scenarios that we're in. I've already had a car where I had to put a transmission in it. I've already had to put a transmission in Acadia, and it was covered last time. So I know that I'm about out about $2,500 to $3,000. 
And, and like Isaiah, we've read the scripture last week, but Isaiah 43 is up on the screen. It says this, forget what happened long ago. Don't think about it. I'm creating something new. And Isaiah, the prophet, writes this in the Bible. But when things in your life happen, you're like, how can I forget about what happened? Because last time it happened, it put me in debt, and I'm going through it again now. Some people, when they're sick in their life and they've been sick, maybe they had a cancer diagnosis or, or maybe they had some other diagnosis and God brought them through it, but then they start seeing little things happen in their life, and it reminds them, you know what? Maybe this is coming on again. And then a pastor comes to you, and he tells you, forget about what happened long ago. Don't think about the past, because God is creating something new. And you want to look me in the face and say, shut up talking to me. But see, here, here's the thing that I love about the Word of God. This is something that one of my seminary teachers taught me, Eddie Rasnick. He said, God will never give you a promise without confirmation. Now, listen to this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is what it says. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And I love this part right here. And God is faithful that he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure See, here's the thing about the Word of God. Here's what I love about that scripture, because Isaiah the prophet is telling me, he's like, forget about what happened, right? But the writer of 1 Corinthians is coming behind him and saying, listen, God's not going to put you in a place where he's going to force you to sin. Because if God is trying to pull me out of sin, why would he put me in a place where I'm going to sin? So what the, pro what the writer of 1 Corinthians is telling me is this, is hard times are going to come. But God will never leave you in them. He tells me, he says, but when you find your way out, because God is going to provide it, don't forget that he's trying to do something new in your life. The reason why we can't focus on the past is because if we focus on the past, we'll miss God's promise that he gives to us for a future. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that as you speak through me this morning, that God, they won't hear my voice and that they won't hear my, my tiredness, that they won't hear my mistakes or my mess ups this morning, God, but that we all hear your voice and that this morning that we're reminded that God, you're faithful. You're faithful in our past. You're faithful in our present. And you will for sure be faithful in our future. So, God, this morning, as we talk about the cheat code, pray that our minds are clear, our ears are open, and that we hear from you. And all God's children said, amen. Exodus chapter 14. And I'm, I'm going to give you the back story because we all know about the parting of the Red Sea. But I want to give you the back story. Moses was born during a time where Pharaoh wanted to kill all the babies. And, and Moses' mom hit him, and what she did was she, she just said, hey, God's going to do something great through him. And so she, what she did was she built this wicker basket, and she put him in it, and then she sent him downstream. And as he went downstream, uh, Pharaoh's daughter picked him up, and they had uh, someone like uh, uh, someone that worked in their house. I don't want to mess up the word, but they had someone that worked in their house that nursed him and took care of him and, and, and gave him health. And he ended up being raised in this house, but all of a sudden he gets his calling. And here's one of those side notes that, have no, that has nothing to do with this message, but when God gives you a calling, not everybody's going to agree or accept it or understand it. But here's the crazy thing about callings. God did not give them the same calling that he gave you so they may not understand why you're thanking God and praising God for where he has you, but you know that God's going to do something great because you're not focused on the past. You're focused on the promise. So what happens is as Moses gets his calling, he kills a guard. He's told to lead the people out of Pharaoh's captivity, and now he brings the people out of Pharaoh's captivity. And now they have reached this pinnacle point in the story where they have Pharaoh's army behind them in the Red Sea in front of them. But we're going to go about a few steps back because I feel like there's some important parts in the story that a lot of pastors skip over. We always want to go straight to the Red Sea and say, this is what happened at the Red Sea. But God had made some preparations. Look at somebody say preparations. Look at somebody else say preparations. Here's the thing about God. When God is sending you into a certain season of your life, he'll always make preparations. You may not always understand the preparation. Guess what? You may not always see the preparation, but God will always make 
preparation. And in Exodus chapter 14, starting at verse 4, it says this. God, Christ is God is talking at this moment, and he says, I will make the king stubborn again, and he will try to catch you. Then I will destroy him and his army. People everywhere will praise me for my victory, and Egyptians will know that I really am the Lord. The Israelites obeyed the Lord and camped where he told them to. Here's some points that I want you to take home with you. Listen, God already knew what Moses was about to face and had a plan. God already knew what you were going to face in your life, and guess what? Before you faced it, before you reached this moment in your life, he had a plan. Before you shed your first tear, before you got your first diagnosis, before that you went to your first doctor visit, God had a plan. So when Moses approached the Red Sea, or when Moses knew that he was walking this way, God had a plan. Here's the thing that happens is Moses was not dumb to the fact that the Red Sea was there because the Red Sea, it stretches a hundreds of thousand miles. As a matter of fact, the Red Sea is actually over a thousand feet deep. So it was not some shocker that he was headed in this direction. And I'm sure that at some point in the back of his mind, he was like, you know what? How are we going to get through this water? How are we going to get through this place that we're in? How are we going to make it to the other side of this situation? And sometimes in our life, we reach that point where we say, how am I going to make it to the other side of this situation? Because I've been here before. I've been in this place where my car needed a transmission. I've been in this place where my daughter had to go to the doctor. I've been in this place where the bills don't match my bank account. I've been in this place where me and my spouse are arguing every day. I've been in this place where the cravings for drugs and alcohol come back. I've been in this place before. I've seen this Red Sea. Now, how am I going to get to the other side? And you would think that when he hears Christ say, I'm going to make... Pharaoh's heart stubborn, but trust me in it, that he'd be like, I got you, Jesus. Okay, that's cool, but here's the reality. Just like he knew the Red Sea, he knew Pharaoh's army. And he knew that a bunch of slaves that he, were, that he was escaping out of Egypt, that they were not going to be able to take down Pharaoh's army. He, I'm sure that there was some worry and concern, and I wish that the Bible had, you know how in NFL games sometimes they mic up the players? I wish that during biblical times they would mic up like Moses and Peter, like when he was in jail, and, and we could hear what they're saying. Because I'm sure that during that time when, when God said, listen, I'm going to make Pharaoh real upset at you, and he's going to come after you, I'm sure Moses would be like, you going, what? When I was younger, I'll, for, I'll never forget, my teacher told my mom, she, or told me, she said, I'm going to call your mom. And I'm going to talk to her. And listen, I've been down that road before. And I knew, because see, back then, like I said last week, in the 90s, you could whip your kids. And I knew that when that phone rang, I was going to get my butt torn up. Believe it or not, I was not always the model student. (laughs) But I remember when that phone rang. And and when that phone rang, I was like, how am I going to get to the other side of this? And, And I would come up with every excuse in the world. And my mom probably remembers this story. You remember that time I stuffed toilet paper down my pants? You remember that? And my mom used to, when she whipped me, she always gave me this, like she would preach a sermon. If you've ever heard my mom pray, you know what I'm talking about. My mom would say, can I pray for you? And 45 minutes later, we're saying amen. But she would say, God doesn't want you to act like this. He's got so much better for you. Let me give you some parents. If, 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 if your kid thinks they're in trouble, especially if you still spank your kids, we don't hear anything you're saying. All we, we're just waiting for the pain to end. So if you're trying to encourage me before you're about to whip me, I don't hear nothing you saying, especially if you're about to hit me with a belt. I was abused when I was a child. I'm just trying to get that out there. But uh, but imagine how Moses felt. Imagine how Moses felt when he's like, hey, I'm going to take you through this, but I'm going to take you through this so that the world know that I'm really God. It's like when I was younger, when my mom was like, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. No, it's not. Give me the belt. No, I'm just kidding. But... My mom going to whip me out to the service. But imagine how Moses felt. Now, imagine your own life. Imagine you come to church and you tell somebody in this church that you're going through it. And maybe they've been through some stuff. And they look at you and say, God's going to bring you through it. And, and it's like, you know what? I'm just waiting for God to hit me with this belt. You're not trying to hear me read you some scriptures or pray you through some things. You're waiting for the belt to hit because you know that eventually this thing of the belt's going to end. And I'm sure that Moses was sitting there like, okay, something's got to give. Either God's really going to save me or, Mo- or Pharaoh's going to defeat me but either way this will all be over and I'm sure that at some point in time he was sitting there saying okay where's the cheat code because this whole time 
He hadn't been able to get out of everything. Murdered a guard, got out of it. Supposed to be killed by Pharaoh, got out of it. He, he went before Pharaoh and all this stuff happened, got out of it. See, video game cheat codes were created before you even know the existence of the game was going to come forth. See, therefore, the creator of the game provided a way in which you may succeed. Listen, the creator knew that you may need some help before you knew that you would need help. And therefore, he provided a way in which you could find the help before the help was ever needed. If you take one thing away this morning, let it be this. God already knew. Before you took your first breath this morning, God already knew. And you're like, but Vince, you're talking about cheat codes and so on and so forth. How, where's my help in all this that I'm going through? Where's the help? Where's, where's the saving in all this? Watch what happens right here. You ready? In verse 5, it says, when the king heard that the Israelites had finally left, he, he and the officials that changed their minds and said, look what we have done. We let them get away and they will no longer be our slaves. And the king got his war chariots and army ready. And it says he commanded his officers in charge of over 600 of the best chariots and all his other chariots to start after the Israelites. And the Lord made the king so stubborn that Eve, that he went after them while the Israelites proudly went on their way. But the king's horses and chariots and soldiers caught up with them while they were camping by the Red Sea. While the Israelites saw the king coming with his army, they were frightened and begged the Lord to help. They also complained to Moses. Wasn't there enough room in Egypt to bury us? Is that why you, was there not enough room in Egypt to bury us? Is that why you brought us out here to die in the desert? Why did you bring us out of Egypt anyway? It says, while we were there, didn't we tell you to leave us alone? We'd rather be slaves in Egypt than die in the desert. Here, here I am, and I'm telling you, I'm feeding you all this stuff. God's got you. You're good to go. But here's the reality. I can tell you that God is going to protect you in the future. I can tell you that God has got you. God's going to bring you through the things you're going through. That God is going to make a way out of no way and so on and so forth. I can tell you all this kind of stuff. But the reality is it's standing right in front of you as Pharaoh and his army on one side and the Red Sea on the other. So I can tell you that God is faithful and God is good. But the reality is this, is that if God has control of my life, why did he put me in this situation, in this circumstance? You ever been there? Ever ask God that? God, if you control the universe, if, if you really control the universe, why did you put me in this situation? I remember I was playing Mario Brothers one day. We bought this NES game system because my wife loves it. And my wife gets on my nerves. I hate playing games with my wife that she knows how to play. She sit up there, she playing. She going to town. And she's like, your turn. And she knows where all these tones are. She knows where raccoon tail is. Talk to my wife about Mario Brothers. You'll have a whole long conversation. So she's playing and she's doing her thing. And then she dies. So then I play. I ain't get that far because, see, in Mario Brothers, I don't go for all those secret tunnels. I'm just trying to get through the game. So I'm running through the game and I'm doing my thing. And, and all of a sudden, I jump this, this, this little tunnel thing. And then I get hit by one of the little owl-looking things that walk like this, you know? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And my wife says, oops, she lost my turn. I hate playing video games with my wife. And eventually, to save our marriage, I just threw the controller down. I said, I'm done. I don't even want to play no more. I'm sick of playing games with you. Because, see, my wife gets real mean when she plays video games. Mom, she said your mom one time. You need to talk to her about that. But <clears throat> my, my wife gets real mean with it. She don't care how old you are. You can be 60 or you can be six years old. If my wife starts beating you in Mario Brothers, she's going to talk as much junk as she possibly can. And she's like, you know what? Yeah, you don't know how to play. Yeah, you don't know. How to. But see, if I try to play my wife in a game that I know how to play, she gets all mad and so on and so forth, and then she don't want to play me. But how many times in life do we get that way? 
How many times in life do you play a game or maybe you watch a game, maybe you watch a football game. We were at the Falcons game this last Thursday or Friday night and I'm watching the game and I'm yelling down at the field like I'm actually their coach and they're going to actually hear me. How many times do you do that in life and then all of a sudden when they start losing or things don't go your way, you're like, see, all you had to do is listen to me. That's all you had to do. And that's what the people that Moses had just brought out of captivity, that's what they were saying. Why did you bring me out here? Did you just bring me out here to die? And here I am saying, oh, God, it's faithful. Just trust God. And every day that you're going through the hell in your life, you pray, you listen to all the worship songs, you read all the scriptures, but yet things are still unraveling right in front of your eyes. Now watch what Moses does, because this is what I as a pastor do. You ready? Moses, this is what it says in verse 13. It says, but Moses answered, don't be afraid, be brave, and you will see the Lord save you today. These Egyptians will never bother you again. The Lord will fight for you, and you won't have to do a thing. And see, I'm sitting up here saying, God is faithful. If you're faithful to God, he's faithful to you. And I expect for God to be like, man, I heard what you said, Vince. That was, that was fire. I'm ready to go. That was lit. Isn't that how God talks, right? That's how he talks to my brain. And he's like, I got you, Vince. I got this. But watch what God says to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, why do you keep calling out to me for help? Wait. Why do you keep calling out to me for help? That wasn't the answer I expected. I expected for you to do something, you know, pizzazz and wow and bing, bang, bong and fix their life. That, that's what I was expecting. But I was never expecting for you to say those words. Why do you keep calling out to me? I call out to you for help because that's what you told me to do. You said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me now, for I am gentle and low in heart. And here you'll find rest for your soul. And God, I hear you, but I'm so tired, I don't think I can keep going. So I tell you, keep trusting God. You're like, Vince, what did, what did God tell you about my situation? Well, see, I, I talked to him, and I told him everything. He said, why do I keep bothering him? But watch what he says next. And here's a part that pastors, myself, we don't preach. It says, tell the Israelites to move forward. Come again? Maybe you didn't see the water. See, there, that, that is a thousand feet deep. That's, that's something that I, I, I know I can't do. When I was younger, I remember reading this story and saying, I'm going to walk on water. Y'all ever try that? It's the greatest thing ever. Not now, because if I fall now, I'm going to be hurt for like a week and a half. But when I was younger, I was standing at the edge of the pool, right? And then you just take off running and see how far you can get. And see, in my brain, I'm thinking, man, I ran halfway across that pool. There is, I, I didn't get two feet into there, two steps into the pool before I fell. But here's God, and he's like, listen, stop bothering me. Keep moving forward. But watch what he says right here in verse 16. He says, then hold your walking stick over the seat. The water will open up and make a road where you can walk through on dry ground. I will make the Egyptians so stubborn that they will go after you. Then I will be praised because of what happens to the king and his chariots and the cavalry. The Egyptians will know for sure that I am the Lord. Now listen, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about this. Let's pause for just a second. Here's God, or here's Moses. He's like, okay, God, listen. Pharaoh's a little bit upset. He's right here. The Red Sea is right here. I'm running out of time. What am I to do? God, I, listen. My problems are right here. My future problems are right here. Chaos is right here. What am I supposed to do? He says, just keep walking. So wait, you want me to just walk into more problems and situations? You want me to walk and you want me to walk and die? Because listen, here's the thing. He says, listen, hold out your staff and the sea will open up. And, and I'm sure that the Pharaoh was like, I meant that Moses was like, wait one second. So what you're telling me is if I hold out a stick, that I'm gonna be able to walk through this thing. 
Here's the thing about God. You ready? Here, here's the crazy thing about God. His ways and plans will never match ours. But they'll always be perfect. I was watching video games from years back. And I was looking at how graphics had advanced. And there's this, we were at the uh, Stars and Strikes a couple weeks ago. I meant to upload this video and I totally forgot. But back in the day, video games used to look so unrealistic, right? But like, the thing is, is now they look extremely realistic and they have this, they have a thing called an Oculus and you put it over and it's like an immersive type game. And no matter where you look, you're in the game. And a couple weeks ago, we had our family night at Stars and Strikes. My family and I, we decided to do a, a scary room because I love scary things. So we decided to do a scary room. And if you want to see the video, let me know. Amy has it. I've got it. My family has it. I'll show it to you. I may just post it up on the North page so you all can see it. But what happened was is my daughter, we're in this thing. And you can't see out to see who's watching you, but they can see you clearly on the inside. So on the inside, my daughter's wearing her, her little Oculus things, Asia. So she's wearing it. And Asia's running around like she's a burglar in a house. I didn't understand it. She's like this. And I was like, what is happening? She's like, I was, she, we had to get certain objects and take it to this whole candle thing. So she had this object. She's like this. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Now, you can't see this during the game, but you see it on the outside on the video. So then Asia goes backwards. And she just falls. <laughs> You've got to see it. And she screams when she falls. It don't bother me because I'm like, this is a game. I could pull off my headset at any time. But she got so involved in this game that it became real. And for many of us, the things in our life that we're going through, we give it so much time and attention that it becomes more real than our faith. And we forget that all we have to do is take off the headset. We forget that all we have to do is trust God. Yeah, you know what? You may see some more scary things before that headset gets off. You may not forget some things that you've been through, but eventually the headset's going to come off. You're going to realize what I thought was so bad was not bad at all because I had the cheat code the entire time. Lamont, let me borrow you real quick. Let me show you what Moses probably felt like. Come here, Lamont. I've never used you. I have used Lamont. There's an old school game when I was a youth pastor back in the day. It was called, I'm not going to tell you the name of the game because then you may go sit down. But what's going to happen is you agree to this game, right? All right, good. You're not going to hold the church liable in case you choke, right? Good. All right. The game is called Fluffy Buddy. You ready? So I'm going to ask you a riddle, very simple riddle. The riddle was asked to me. If you miss it, I'm not going to give you the answer. You're just going to take a marshmallow and put it in your mouth. Don't chew it. Just put it in your mouth. Okay? You ready? For, the, for, the, it's for Jesus. There are 30 cows and 28 chickens. How many didn't? How many didn't? You want this? There you go. All right. All right. Think about it. I'm going to ask you again. There are 38 cows and 28 chickens. How many didn't? Could you stop looking at me like that when you put that marshmallow in your mouth? It makes me feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> there are 38 cows. 30 cows. No, I would say, chickens. yeah, it's going to be 30. I would say 38 cows. I kept saying 38 cows. There are 38 cows and 28 chickens. How many didn't? There are 38 cows and 28 chickens. I feel like I'm about to get hit. <laughs> How many didn't? There are 38 cows, 28 chickens. How I forgot the question. <laughs> there are 30 cows and 28 chickens. How many did you? Okay. 
So now, here, just repeat the riddle back to me. Go ahead. There, come again. Come again. I didn't. I didn't say clowns. There are not no clowns. Say again. What? Thirty clowns. No, there's no cow. Uh, there's no clowns. What? Uh huh. Don't worry about it. You're good. Give it up for Lamont, everybody. But. <laughs> I didn't bring anything for you to spit that out. See, normally I have Quentin. He takes care of all that. But imagine. And actually, you got the answer right. It was 10. But anyway, so, but imagine. <laughs> imagine. If, <laughs> imagine if that was you. And you ask God, how do I get through it? And he sounded like Lamont trying to repeat that riddle back to me. And that's how Moses felt. That's how he felt when he's standing at a Red Sea and Pharaoh's army is behind him. And God just says, hey, keep moving forward. Stick out your staff and walk through it. But watch what, watch what happens in verse 19. It says this. All this time, God's angels had gone ahead of Israel's army. But now he moved behind them. It says, a large cloud also gone ahead of them, and, but, but now it moved between the Egyptians and the Israelites. It said, the cloud gave light to the Israelites, but made it dark for the Egyptians. Then night, and during the night, they could not come any closer. It says, Moses stretched his arms over the sea, and the Lord sent a strong east wind that blew all night until there was dry land where the water had been. The sea opened, and the Israelites walked through on dry land with, all wall of, with a wall of water on each side. The, is the Egyptian chariots and cavalry went after them. And there's a whole lot that's happening here. You ready? It says, in the beginning, the angels were in front of them. Then all of a sudden, they were behind them. And it says a large cloud had gone ahead of them. But, but now it moved between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And it says the cloud gave light to the Israelites, but it made it dark for the Egyptians. And during the night, they could not come any closer. And it says this, Mar Moses stretched his hand over the sea, and the Lord sent a strong east wind, and it blew the wall. And it, and it says that the wind that blew all night until there was dry land where the water had been. The sea opened up, and the Israelites walked through on dry land, and there was water on either side side, the Egyptian chariots and cavalry went after them. Now listen, I want to explain something to you. You have to understand the Red Sea because it makes this story a way, way better. The Red Sea was thousand, over a thousand feet deep, 1,600 feet deep. Here's the other thing. The Red Sea in size was over a hundred thousand in diameter. Think about this. Here's the Red Sea and it's in front of me. Here's 600 of, of Pharaoh's greatest army men behind me. God says, keep moving forward. Trust the cheat code. Here's the thing about cheat codes when you would play games. You ready? When you play games and you use the cheat code, there were some games where it would go ding, ding, and you knew that you got the cheat code. But there were some games where you didn't know you got the cheat code until it was time for the cheat code to become the cheat code. And sometimes in your life, God may call you to a place where he may say, you know what? Stretch forth your faith and trust me. And he may say, you know what? I know what happened in the past. I know what the doctor said last time. I know what your marriage went through last time. I know what your spirit went through last time. I know what your faith went through last time. But do me a favor and take that rod and stretch it forth. And he's like, just trust me of what's going to happen on the other end. But here's the other part of that story. First, you've got to be willing to move. See, if we stay in the past, if we stay where we were, We'll never be able to see the glory of God in the future. And Moses stood at that Red Sea. And a lot of times pastors preach it like this. And he stretched forth his rod. No, I'm, I'm sure he took his time. I'm sure he was like. It's like walking upstairs in this building. Got to put that foot down like this. I'm sure Moses was like. Sometimes it's like that. 
Sometimes your faith is not so bold where you're going to be like, yeah, Jesus, we got this thing. Sometimes your faith is going to take just a little bit of movement, a piece at a time, a prayer at a time, a, 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 a day at a time. It's going to take just a little bit of trusting. You're going to be moving forward, but you may be moving slow. Don't look at nobody else's paces because they ain't got nothing to do with you. You may end up inching slowly to the water. But here's the part of the story that I love. Anybody else notice that the story does not give us a timeline? It didn't say they made it through in a couple days or a couple hours or a couple minutes. But what it did say is the entire way God protected them. Here's the beauty of the story of faith. When faith and obedience collide, God honors it. Faith tells me that God is real, to trust his word. That when he says, stretch forth your staff, I'm going to do something great, that he's going to do it. Obedience is when I do it. When God sees my faith and my obedience come together, he does something great. Here's the other part of the story. You ready? See, a lot of times in our life, we want to think of God as some magic Houdini person that's just going to be like, you know what, I'm going to remove all of Pharaoh's army, and I'm going to remove the Red Sea, and I'm just going to act like it never happened. Where would be the glory in that? If I was a pilot, and I saved a plane full of people, and all of a sudden the story said, he saved a bunch of people on the plane, you'd be like, but how he do it, though? But when the story says... The plane was going down, the engines blew, and he was able to coast that thing into the water, and nobody was hurt. It gives life to the story. What am I saying? God may sing you through some hell or allow you to go through some hell so that the rest of the world can know that heaven is real. So when Moses stretched forth his staff, he was not doing it. For his glory. He was doing it for the glory of God. Watch what happens. You ready? Pharaoh's army was still coming after them. I'm telling you, if you've got something going on in your life, there's a chance that you're still going to have something going on in your life. There's a chance that life is still going to be hard. But watch what happens. You ready? Verse 24, it says, But before daylight, the Lord looked down at the Egyptian army from the fiery cloud and made them panic. Their chariots, wheels got stuck, and it was hard for them to move. So the Egyptians said to one another, let's leave these people alone. The Lord is on their side and fighting against them. And then the Lord told Moses, look, God was like, listen, I made you a promise. I said that you won't have to worry about them again. See, God could have said, you know what, they're running. But see, the, the Egyptians, they would have came back later on. Pharaoh's army would have came back later on and bothered them. See, can I tell you something that when God, keep, when God makes a promise, he keeps a promise. Now watch what happens. So he said, he told Moses this. Stretch your arm towards the sea. The water will cover the Egyptians in their cavalry and chariots. I, 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 if, if I was writing the scripture, it would say this. Stretch your arm towards the sea and watch my promise fulfilled. Because the Bible says that Moses stretched out his arm. And at daybreak, the water rushed towards the Egyptians. They tried to run away. But the Lord drowned them in the sea. The water came and covered the chariots, the cavalry, and the whole Egyptian army that had followed the Israelites into the sea. And it says this, not one of them was left alive, but the sea had made a wall of water on each side of the Israelites, so they walked through on dry, grain, on dry land. Now watch this, you ready? On that day when the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the shore, they knew that the Lord had saved them. Man. But watch what it says. Watch what, it, watch what they say. You ready? Because of the Lord's mighty power he had used against the Egyptians, the Israelites worshipped him and trusted him and his servant Moses. Can I tell you something? That when God gives you a promise, he's going to fulfill it every single time. But you don't understand, Vince. God told me that he was going to heal my such and such. My loved one, and God told me he was going to heal me. What about my loved one that died when I prayed and God said he was going to heal him? But, and, but, they, but see, here's the beauty of it all. They got their healing. They're made whole. 
And if you were able to talk to them right now at this very moment, they would say, I'm not going back. But but this, you don't understand. I'm going through it right now. Keep moving forward. But you don't understand, Vince, I've been through this before. I know the signs. I've seen this before. I've seen this type of CAT scan. I've heard this type of murmuring. I've gone through this. I've felt this pain before. But see, God is the the same God. And if he brought you through it once, he'll bring you through it again. But you've got to keep moving forward in Luke 23. Into Luke 22, Jesus was talking to Simon. He said this. He said, Simon, listen to me. Satan has demanded the right to test each one of you as a farmer does when he separates wheat from the husk. But I love this next part. But Simon, I have prayed that your faith will be strong. Watch this part right here. And when you have come back to me, help others. Notice how he did not say if, he said when. When God gives you a promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you, he means it. When he says I will not place on you more than you can bear, he means it. When he says that I have a plan, a future for you that involves hope, he means it. So when he said to Simon Peter, when you come back to me, when he speaks into your life that he's going to bring you through that thing that you're going through, he means it, but you've got to keep moving forward and trust that no matter how deep the sea is or how vast the army is, God is still good. Here's the reality. You've got an army behind you, a Red Sea in front of you, but you've still got a God with you. That's the cheat code. Never forget that your God is with you. A movie came out in 1995 by the name of Braveheart. It starred Mel Gibson. And I love the story of Braveheart because it takes a bunch of just lowly, normally normal people. There's a huge army coming at them on this scene. In this part, I've watched it a million times, but it causes my heart to race because you see this army coming at them, and they're coming at them, and Mel Gibson in the movie, he had given them a plan. And as I'm watching it, I'm sitting up here screaming at the, at the screen like, you got to move. And when the cheat code, I type it in, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here waiting. When is this cheat code going to work? And at the most opportune time, It works. Watch this scene from Braveheart. before it got there. (laughs) Sorry. That's all I got. Thank God we got children's church today. (laughs) But maybe you feel like them. I don't know what your army is this morning. I don't know what's coming at you. 
I don't know what battle you're facing this morning. I don't know what battle you started facing last week, last month, last year. But I do know this, that God has a plan. And it may feel like that army's coming at you with all they got as fast as they got. And the voice of God is saying, just stretch forth your faith. But God, I've been through this, man. I've read this story. Like, I don't care. Stretch forth your faith and trust me. Can I tell you that God will use this moment that you're in for his glory if you stretch forth your faith. Watch this last slide. It says it, says it this way. You may be going through it, but never forget who is in it. His name is Jesus. As the worship team makes their way up here this morning, I don't know all the right answers or all the perfect words to say for what you're going through, but I do know this, is that if God made a promise, he will fulfill it. And I don't know how big your army is, but I do know this, that they're not bigger than my God. And I don't know how long you have trusted God with what you're going through. I don't know how many tears you've shed. I don't know how many prayers you've prayed. I don't know how many times you've praised God for victories, but now you're feeling defeat. But I do know this, that no matter what you're going through, God is in it with you. And he will not. He has not. And he will never leave you alone. This morning, as the worship team sings, I, my, my prayer for you is this. Is that you don't negate the fact that Pharaoh's army is behind you. And that the Red Sea is in front of you. But that you remember that God is in it with you. And if you stretch forth your faith, he'll make a way. I promise you that. I promise you that. Let's stand and let's worship this morning. The altar is open. Wow. 
just breaks a man Break him down to his knees God, I've been broken more than a time or two Yes, Lord and Then he picked me up And showed me what it means to be a man Come on and sing Imagine how Moses felt when he was like, hey, my yesterday is gone. Man, 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 man. When he could look back and see Pharaoh's army underwater. This morning, my hope, my prayer for you is this. Is that you take what you're going through in life. Y'all can sit down with, did you take what you're going through in life? And you say, God, I trust you with it. And that one day you'll be able to look back at all the armies that came at you. All those things that tried to take you out. All those things that tried to bury you and bury your faith and bury the calling that God had on your life. That one day you can look back at the Red Sea. Say, I had all my hope in what I knew, but one day all my hope was placed in Jesus' hands. And I thank God that I don't have to worry about that anymore. And then what happens is this. You ready? Here's what happens. Your battles become your victory stories. And instead of you saying, I'm fighting or I'm going through it. Instead of saying, man, the devil is sending me through it this week, you can look and you go, pro, or you can proclaim with great confidence. You could say, you know what? There was a day when I was at North Church of Rockmore, or there was a day when I was on 75, or there was a day when I was on 278, or there was a day when I was in the local grocery store, or there was a day when I was sitting at my home, when I finally had this moment where I said, why am I holding on to my faith? If I just hold on to it, it doesn't do anything, but it's like a comfort blanket. But when I extended and I trusted God with it, he moved and he did something and now I can look back and the things that I was going through are now the things of my past and no longer are they chasing me but they're skeletons in the Red Sea that Christ allowed me to cross see there's beauty in that story there's beauty in that moment my prayer and my hope for you this week is that before you come back into this building that you look at the army behind you that you look at the Red Sea before you, you look at your faith, you say, God, you have your way. Right. And watch what he does. Watch what he does. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that this week that we'll learn to stop looking at our past and focus on you. Because God, you are our present. God, you hold our future. And God, you can heal us from our past. But first, we've got to place it in your hands. So God, this morning, I pray that before we leave this building, that no matter what we're going through this morning, that we remember you are the cheat code. And before this moment came, you knew that it was going to come, and you had a plan, and you're using it for your glory. So God, 
all the pain, all the tears, all the fears, all the whatever. You know it, you see it, and you're not leaving us in it. You're using it for your glory. So God, take our faith. Open red seas. Destroy armies so that the world may see you. In your precious only name, and all God's children said, amen. This morning, we have something cool happening. We had Wolfgang join the church, and God placed something in my heart a long time ago. He said, Vince, well, he used Ricky a long time ago to speak to me. He said, Vince, you're doing too much. He said, you're trying to do too much. You're trying to carry the weight of the world or the weight of the north on your shoulders. He said, you got to stop. Didn't you, Ricky? And I said, okay. And I, and I spent some time praying, and I said, okay, God, what is it that you would have me do? And if you knew me when I first started North, well, I had to have my hands on everything. If it was happening, I had to, I had to know about it. I had to know what was going on. Right, Amy? Right. But now I'm like, I don't care what you do. No, I'm just kidding. I care. But I'm more, some people may say two offhands, but I trust God with the people that he places in leadership. And this morning, we're going to be ordaining another deacon in our church. And we don't like calling them deacons. We call them servant leaders because that's what they are. And a lot of people don't understand where the term deacon or the role of deacon came from. And if you ever study Acts, you'll see where Paul was walking. He was preaching the gospel. And in Acts chapter 6, you'll see where some guys stepped up and they said, hey, why are you doing everything? And, and here's the scripture in Acts 6, 2 through 4. It says, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said this. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. But this is what he said. Brothers and sisters, he said, choose tw- two seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. A lot of people think that being a deacon is just sweeping and mopping and fixing stuff. So much bigger than that. Yeah, they do a lot of that. That's membership. Actually, that's a pastor job sometimes. But here's the thing. It's like a chain reaction. Ricky's the elder, so God puts him in my life to say, Vince, slow down. Quentin is our connections pastor. So God allows Quentin to be able to go and talk to some of you guys whenever you're missing church or do all-in classes. My deacons, they make my load so much easier. Even this morning, Wayne came up to me and said, actually yesterday and this morning, he said, what do you need for me to do? And I was just like, I don't even know. I'm not used to that. But when I prayed and I said, God, who would you have make a deacon? And, and it was right in front of my face because I've known Lamont. Come on up here. Come on up here, Jennifer. I've known Lamont and, and Jennifer for years. I've, I've known Lamont for about 15 years. Funny story is Lamont didn't want me marrying my wife when we were about to get married. He didn't like me. He didn't like me at all. He didn't even know me. He just didn't like me. I feel that. I feel that about my daughter's friend that's a boy. But <clears throat> but, it, but I know that he is full of the word, and I know that he is full of the spirit of God. And marshmallows. And marshmallows now. <laughs> and I know that he will be, that he'll do anything, not for north, but for the furtherance of the kingdom. So I'm going to invite Wayne up here, and I'm going to invite Ricky up here. Ricky Shedd is our head elder, and he is, when I can't be a voice, he is a voice, and it's, it's, it's a very deep voice, and Wayne is our other deacon, and I actually spoke to these guys this morning, you didn't even know I spoke to them this morning, and I said, how do you feel about Lamont becoming a deacon? So I'm going to bring them up here this morning, and I'm going to get, grab a Kira's mic from back there for me, it's, it's back there on that stand right there, awesome, perfect. All right, so we're going to start off with, with, with Wayne. You, don't try to pass it on. You hold on to it. Wayne, you've seen Lamont around the church. Do you feel that he is fit to be a deacon here at North Church of Rockmart? 
brings me some of his barbecue. Yeah. Wow. We put barbecue skizzle ices on it. Okay. Okay. No, yes. Definitely. All right. It's, it's, not, it's I think it's on. It's just really soft. All right, Ricky Shed, you have seen Lamont Toon um, at our church, at Toad, that's how you pronounce his last name, and uh, his wife, Jennifer. And do you feel that he is fit to be a deacon here at North Church of Rock Mart? Uh, yes, I do. He's, uh, he's always here to help out, no matter what. He's always here to correct us when we mess up. So, yes, I do. <laughs> All right, will you pass that to Lamont, please? Lamont, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I will give you a response. And if you agree with this, you and Jennifer will answer as such. Lamont and Jennifer, every Christian is called to follow Jesus Christ, serving God through the power of the Holy Spirit. God has now called you to a very special ministry here at North Church of Servanthood. Do you believe that you are truly called by God in North Church to the life and work of a deacon. If so, please respond with, I believe I am so called. I believe I am so called. I believe I am so called. Lamont and Jennifer, do you now in the presence of God and your church family commit to assist in responding to the needs of this church family to help bear burdens of grief, trouble, or any kind of sorrows and assist in the ministries of North Church? If so, please respond with, I do with God's help. I do with God's help. Lamont and Jennifer, Will you be faithful in prayer, in the reading and study of your scriptures, and stewardship of spiritual and material goods, and seeking the will of God for the church, and in promoting the unity of Christ's body? So please respond with, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Lamont and Jennifer, will you do your best to pattern your life in accordance with the teachings of Christ, so that you may be a living example to all people, and in all things seek not your own glory, but the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If so, please respond with, I will, with God's help. Lord Church members, would you please stand to your feet? <clears throat> North Church, in placing this call and appoint Lamont and Jennifer, will you faithfully support them there in their ministry through prayer, encouragement, and obedience? If so, will you respond with, we will, with God's help. May the Lord empower all of us here at North Church and you, Lamont and Jennifer, as you work towards the furtherance of God's kingdom through your work, your servanthood, but most of all, through answering every phone call that you get from me. Okay? <laughs> we call the wives up here, too, because we believe that not only... Is ministry a husband thing? It takes two. Can I tell you that I would not be who I am if it was not for God and my wife and my children? They support me and everything. I can't tell you how many times I've been here cleaning up with my wife beside me. Or how many times my wife has been by my side on no sleep at all at a hospital or at someone's house or at a grocery store or here at the church. It's not just one. My wife is my biggest cheerleader. Y'all are my second biggest cheerleader, but my wife is my biggest cheerleader, and she is there with me every step of the way. So today, as we anoint Lamont, we're also anointing Jennifer, because they are in this thing together, and we are in this thing with them. So if you don't mind, Lamont and Jennifer, step over this way. I'm going to ask Ricky if you want to stand behind them, and Wayne, if you want to stand over on that side, and we're going to anoint them and pray over them this morning. I don't have any oil this morning, but I'll spit on my hand. Jesus did it. I can do it too. And if you all don't mind, stretch forth your hands as we pray over them. Father God, this morning, we empower, encourage, watch, and cheer on Lamont and Jennifer as they take this step into ministry together. God, I pray they realize it's not going to be perfect. Man, I've been pastoring for years and I still stumble and fall. But I pray that they never forget that you are the one that's going to pick them up, dust them off, and tell them to keep running. So, God, I pray that they never stop running, not for the sake of North, not for the sake of Vince or Ricky or Wayne or anybody else in this building, but for your glory 
And God, I pray that, that lives are changed through their words and through their actions, God. And I pray that as, as they work for the church or with the church or in the church, God, that they don't see it as just another task, but they see it as, man, I am just as important as the message that is going forth on Sunday morning. Because, God, they are taking things off my plate so that I can run with the word of God. So, God, I not only thank you, but I thank them for the obedience in their servant's heart, for accepting this calling, for accepting this ministry. Bless them a million fold in their obedience. And your precious old name, if we agree with that this morning, all God's children said, amen. Y'all make sure you hug Lamont and Jennifer and congratulate them. Let's give it up for them one time. Man, here we go. We have the end. Got some announcements. We got students tonight. We have our church luau coming up this Sunday. Wednesday night Bible study this Wednesday night online. Uh, children's, we still got it going on. We are, we are trying something out with our children's where you're going to be able to check them in through your phone. Um, not only that, but we're going to have a way. Church Central or Center, whatever it's called, it's great. It is fantastic. But I don't feel as though it fits our church. So we're looking at a new platform. And here's the thing with this platform. It's going to be really cool. It's something that you can actually use on your phone. We'll have a picture of your child. We'll be able to print out labels. You'll be able to print out labels from a wireless printer. And you'll be able to check your child in and check your child out. We are extremely close to finishing up that back room. When I say close, I mean extremely close to finishing up that back room. And it is going to be mind-blowing what God is going to do in that room. If you haven't signed this piece of sheetrock up here, please do sign it. But back to what I was saying. When this new app comes out, you'll see we're about, I'm about to do some things with the children where I can pour into the children. I pour into the adults, I pour into the students, but I have not poured into the children of the church. So I'll be hanging out with those guys. I'll get some of the students to help us out. We'll do like some field day games. We'll go to pumpkin patches and all that cool stuff. And uh, so just to pour into them. Because can I tell you something? A lot of people think that children are the church of the future. But man, if you watch these kids, they're the church of the now. God didn't say suffer not the little children because he thought that they were going to be some future church. He said suffer not them because he knew that they were going to do some things that was going to rock the world today. And that's why we're going to keep pouring into our kids. Amen. Come on. Amen. amen. So I can't wait to see what God does in that children's room. That's number one. Number two, we do have students tonight. Students, make sure you are here at 445. If you got your fishing stuff and you want to hang out, I think we're going to go fishing. Or I may be going to the bowling alley because i got to beat Ethan in the bowling game. If he lied to you this morning, I'm sorry. We're not talking about it. Uh, but anyway, I, Ethan beat me last night, but I don't want to talk about it. We're not talking about it. But anyway, so moving forward, Wednesday night Bible study. Sunday, we do have our church luau. It starts at 630. Please, please, please do me a favor. Do me a huge solid. See Amy before you leave today. She has a list of stuff. That she sent a text to me, and I told her I'll get something out, but I didn't. I'm not looking at her because she's probably shaking her head because she's used to it. But <laughs> see Amy today, and what she'll do is tell you what you can bring and all that good stuff. So please, 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 please see Amy, and, um, and she'll tell you to be there either at 530 or 630. Listen, if she tell you don't be there at 630, don't show up at 630, please. Let, give them time to get this place ready right and all that good stuff. Bring your swim trunks. If you go swimming, I'm telling you now, it's recorded. If you, if you don't know how to swim and you decide to get in a pool, between you and God, you might see them that day. So that's number two. <laughs> Last but not least, we have a um, September 3rd. We have a night of worship. My friend, my brother, my pal, Tim Howard, he'll be here. And not only that, yeah, you clapped that up. That's cool. I like Tim Howard. Um, here, here's the other thing. Our worship team is actually going to be singing that night. We have never done a night of worship. Well, we have. We did it one time. But we have not done it with our new worship team where they're going to be leading that night. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. I'm excited. So this is what I need for y'all to do. On September the 3rd, first September the 3rd, let's invite everybody. I don't care who it is. I don't care if they're an atheist. I don't care if they walk into this church with an upside-down cross and a pentagram on their shirt. Bring them. Because I believe that God can do something great even with that. Sit down, Wolfgang. We're not talking about you. But, <laughs> but I believe that God can do something great that night. But here's the thing. We got to bring them in, right? We can tell them how good the food is. But if they never try, guess what? We just talking a bunch of nonsense, right? Amen. So let's bring them in. That, that's, that's that. Now, here's the most important part of our, or second most important part of our worship, extended part of our worship. It's our giving. Last week, let me just tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You heard my heart and you gave. And I'm going to do it every week. I'm going to ask you to give every week. 
because I believe that God is going to do something great in this church. But here's the thing. I'm just going to be real. Our electric bill is way more than it's ever been. Way more than it's ever been. Had I known it wasn't working last week, we wouldn't even have had it on. We, but, but it is a lot more because we got to run this thing a lot. And when Ricky and Wolfgang are here, we cut the air on because it's hot in this building. And I would not ask them to work if we did not have air in this building. But our electric bill is really high. We got things that we want to do. So I'm going to ask you to give out a conviction, not out of convenience. I'm going to ask you to give like not the church's life depends on it because God's going to keep this church moving regardless if you give or not. But I'm going to ask you to give like Georgia Power Bill depends on it, like Scanner Energy depends on it, like future events depend on it. That's what I'm going to ask you to give. I'm going to ask for you to give with a heart of conviction for the lives that can be changed through our obedience this morning. Amen? Amen. Man, it's like that part where everybody just shuts down. I'm going to ask for you to give like God has blessed you and you're ready to see him bless others. I'm going to ask for you to give like you believe in the vision of North Church. I'm going to ask you to dig deep, give big, and trust that God is not going to fill your bank account, but he's going to change lives through it. Because I'm not one of those pastors. If you send 300, God will give you 3,000. I ain't going to make that promise to you. Because you may give 300 and your lights are off next week. Can't promise you that. But I can promise you this. I can promise you that what you give will keep these lights on. I can promise you that what you give, and even if they're not on, listen. I can promise you that what you give, if we got this building, that I'll be here on this platform proclaiming Jesus is still good. That he wants to change your life. But we got to give. Amen. Come on, amen. amen. Come on, amen. amen. So this morning, can we give out of conviction, not out of convenience? I'm going to do it. I'll, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I don't want to give. But I got to because God calls and compels me to give. Let's pray this morning. Father God, I pray that as we give this morning, that God, you use it for your glory, for your will. God, I thank you for this, this amazing church family. God, beyond money, they give of themselves. And God, I feel like they don't do it for a pat on the back. God, they do it because they want to see lives change. God, when I look at North Church, I see your calling coming to life, your great commission coming to life, your word in 1 John where he says, you got to love your neighbor in order to say you love God. I see a church that has a heart and a burning desire to see lives change. And they do whatever it takes to get them to the cross. So God, bless whatever is given. Bless those who could not give this morning. But God, I pray that you bless every life that will be changed through the obedience of, of us this morning, our church family. In your precious only name and all God's children said, amen. I love you guys. I'll see you next Sunday. Be blessed. All right, just one minute before we do leave. Vince, if you will, step down to the front. I was, uh, I was asked to do this. And when somebody asked me, I just smiled. Because I was going to do it already. God laid it on my heart. Well, <laughs> now, no, uh, Vince will be, he drives fast enough up and down the highway, but he's going to be going real fast. He's going to be flying out. And he's going to do God's work. So I'd like to get to church, if they would, uh, everybody gather up here. We're going to have prayer for it. Uh, and I thought about some things, and then uh, someone else come up to me and said they wanted to say a word, and I said, well, that's good, because I was going to give it to you anyway. So I'm going to get the one who started him on this path to lead us in a word of prayer, and that's your mother. Here you go. My gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Father God, I praise you and thank you for this man of God. Even so, yet as a child, Father, you spoke to my heart as a young child, as a young man, that he would one day carry the gospel. 
And Father God, we know that it's not by power nor by might, but by your spirit. And Father God, even yesterday, as I sat in the back and I thought, 40-something years later, you have brought to pass the very thing that you told me you would do in his life. And for that, Father, I say hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. Father, your word says in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, that before we were in our mother's womb, you knew us. And yet, Lord, you called us as a prophet to the nation. And that is what your son, Vincent, is carrying the gospel to a hurting, lost, and dying world. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, who is Yeshua, that you will use him as he travels. And Father, I pray that the word in him will stir like fire. As Jeremiah said, the word of God was like fire shut up in his bones. Let it be so with this. And so, Lord, I, I, Lord, I look, but um, I touch not the glory of what you're doing because, Father, Lord God, you birthed him through my life, but yet you and you alone through the power of the Holy Spirit do the work that is seen now. And Father God, I praise you and thank you, believing with all my heart that, Lord, as I heard my son say, and it's often said in my heart, that until his last breath, he will serve you. And Father God, I praise you and I thank you for Marina. And the words he spoke is ever so true. Lord, because I give the message to others that Rena is a good wife, an excellent wife, and a pastor's wife. And Lord, thank you as I see my grandbaby serving you, Lord, and just trusting you, and I thank you. But Father, I pray in the name again of Jesus Christ that this man of God would not look back, but keep looking forward by faith. And Lord, when the storms of life come, may he remember what your word says in Isaiah. When, you, when he walketh through the waters, you'll be with him. And through the floods, the floods will not overtake him. And your word says that when he walketh through the fire, that he, Vincent, the in reality car, shall not be burnt, neither shall the flames kindle on him. And so, Lord, for me, I thank you, because in the wee hours of the morning, this morning, I was thinking about my baby. I was thinking about the plane ride and the travel, and you reminded me he is your son. And you will take care of this man of God, this husband, this father, my baby. And that you will use him all the days of his life. So, Father God, thank you that there's life in me still to see your promises fulfilled in his life. And I thank you for that, Lord. And Father, as I end, I thank you for Rick, who is a brother that sticks very close to him and his wife. And bless them, Father, bless them. Bless the church. And may forever you keep your mighty ministry and warning going angels around it. And may, Lord, out of this church, North Church, may multitudes upon multitudes of souls be saved. May it be a place of healing. Though we as a people are not perfect, God's people, but stir in the hearts, Lord, no matter what, that we will move forward. And we, no matter what, will live for you. And, and you have often told me, move forward, Rita. And Lord, Vincent spoke a word, and Lord, a word I had not thought. So Father, as I end, again, I thank you for this man of God, your son, my son, your, your son, and that may he serve you to his very last breath and to his very last heartbeat. So Abba, Father, Daddy, we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. And as I end, your word says in Lamentations 3, 21 to 23, it says, This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. 
for your compassions. They fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thou faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, the great Messiah, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen and amen.